Welcome to Undiscarded, Stories of New York, a podcast brought to you by the City Reliquary Museum and Civic Organization in Brooklyn, New York. Today, I'm sitting with Dave Herman, the founder of the Reliquary, in their permanent collection room, just behind the front lobby. It's not such a large space compared to other museums, but there isn't an inch of it that isn't being used. There are vitrines stuffed with items, artifacts hung on the walls, sculptures in the corner, baseball cards stuck in the small, empty spaces left over. The small, wobbly table we share is made even more precarious with our audio equipment. And I hope it doesn't topple over into the open display case next to us, which takes up the entire height of one wall. This case contains the reliquary's most famous and largest collection, Dozens of different small-scale models of the Statue of Liberty. There are Lady Liberties made of metal, wood, glass, ceramic, and plastic. Some only inches tall and some way bigger. Some painted in gaudy colors and some gray and serious. Some of these were made and sold by the thousands as tourist souvenirs and some are homemade and completely unique. There's even a Hawaiian Lady Liberty wearing a grass hula skirt. Interspersed amongst them are all sorts of Statue of Liberty collectibles from around the world. Postcards, shot glasses, souvenir coins, commemorative plates, and any number of other tributes to the new Colossus from the 13 decades since she was erected. And today we're here to discuss what is perhaps the crown jewel in this collection, which was acquired by the reliquary from the personal belongings of someone who knew the Statue of Liberty perhaps better than anyone ever has. We were very lucky to have an opportunity to meet with Charlie DeLeo, who is known as the Keeper of the Flame. For more than three decades, he was the caretaker of the Statue of Liberty, working for the National Park Service. I think anybody who knows the backstory of the Statue of Liberty and sort of the types of people that go into keeping her the shining icon that she is, knows something about Charlie DeLeo. So he's definitely a bit of a legend in himself, and it was kind of a a moment for me to get to meet one of my heroes. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about Charlie. And from what I know a little bit about what I read about him, he apparently, you know, he was a war veteran Mm -hmm. and he felt he was spared. So when he visited the Statue of Liberty, he just had this immense feeling of gratitude that he was there for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I wish I could say I knew him even better, but from the few moments that I've had to spend time with him, I could say that he's definitely a very humble and sincere person who followed his heart. I think as someone who was inspired by the Statue of Liberty, he decided that was his life's goal was to help stay in tune with the thing that led him and inspired him. I mean, this is someone who clearly, although he was being paid and had a career with the National Park Service, after that came to a logical ending, he continued to volunteer there and, you know, cared for her the way he would care for a mother, I think. And I, of course, she is also known as the mother of exiles. And so it made perfect sense. He also showed me some poems that he would write for the statue. So in the tradition of Emma Lazarus, who wrote the famous poem, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, and so on. That's actually on a plaque on the pedestal itself. He had his own versions of those. Did Charlie ever talk to you about what his day was like? Or what was some of the stuff that he actually did in his day-to-day in yeah. caring for the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, a little bit. And it, and to most people, it might seem mundane, but I think he had a way of taking mundane tasks like polishing windows or sweeping staircases and making them part of his daily rituals. In the same way, like a Buddhist monk, you might think of sweeping around That's what the I thought temple. of. I thought of like mindfulness. People yes. say, you know, to be present in your tasks. Absolutely. Of, you know. This is the ultimate, like he was the monk of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think that was clear in any conversation to have with him is this sense of mindfulness and and just like being present in that space that was inspiring to him. And I know that he had a lot of other related things that were not really part of the official jobs. Like I heard he rescued a lot of birds. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I heard that he like, there were like pigeons that, that would, would get stuck sense. there and like he would like help them out. And yeah. then 
I think he, I don't, you might know more about this, but I think he also wrote letters, right? He wrote letters to kids who got in touch with him and he would buy little souvenirs from his own money to send back to them. Uh, that's so, so <laughs> yes, that seems completely what you would expect of his story. <laughs> yes, I could see that very much. Yeah, I think that's all just in being there, being presence, being the living embodiment of the Statue of Liberty. He, in a sense, was her living soul, you know? Um, and I think that he probably in some sense may have imagined that if she could do something about this bird that crashed into her light at night that she would and so that was his job and his job was not defined by the National Park Service it was just sort of appreciated by them I think it was defined by him he didn't really he wasn't somebody who needed to be told clearly like this is what we expect of you he expected so much of himself because of the way he appreciated that role and today's artifact which occupies a place of honor in its own plexiglass cube, is like Charlie's daily work in caring for the statue, because it's both mundane and extraordinary. It's a light bulb, a large incandescent light bulb, of a kind you might find in any outdoor lighting in the 1990s. But this particular bulb was one that was used to illuminate Lady Liberty's torch. The Statue of Liberty was originally titled Liberty Enlightening the World, and that enlightenment was meant both poetically and literally, as she was intended to be a lighthouse guiding ships into New York Harbor. This never really worked, though. Her torch just wasn't big enough to be useful for navigation. And all through her history, engineers have revamped the torch to try and make it brighter. At the beginning, the light actually came from within the flame itself. So the flame was constructed almost like a stained glass window might be with lots of little panels in a three-dimensional shape of this flame. And the light inside would shine through those panels. So if you look back in some of the old photos of Charlie DeLeo, you can see him actually in the earlier version um, when he was there in the 70s. He had the job of actually replacing the interior bulbs as well. Legend has it that in 1972, Charlie DeLeo's boss found out that he was sneaking up into the torch where he wasn't allowed. Instead of giving him the axe, his boss gave him the important task of caring for the torch. And from then on, DeLeo became the keeper of the flame, climbing a narrow 40-foot ladder to change the light bulbs inside. Through the years, the mechanism of the torch changed, up to the current incarnation of a sculpted flame made out of copper covered in 24 karat gold, which is illuminated by bulbs pointed at it from the outside. Throughout these changes and up to his retirement, Charlie was in charge of maintaining these lights. There are lots of pictures of him perched high above in the torch performing his duties. And of course, discarding burnt out bulbs was also part of his job. And that's where the reliquary's bulb came from. It was from one of the floodlights used in this external system in around 1994. On one hand, it's a piece of trash, something that's outlived its usefulness and been replaced. But on the other hand, it's a vital, tangible piece of the magic of the statue, an actual source of the enlightenment she was built to spread to the world. So what did he think of your collection? <laughs> well, I, from what I could tell, he was impressed. I think Charlie was could see a kinship in our desire to positively show the impact of the Statue of Liberty, not just on individuals like us, but on many people from very diverse backgrounds. Tell me about your relationship to Lady Liberty, <laughs> because I know that's sort of how the idea of the reliquary ended up coming about, right? There was a collection of Statue of Liberties outside of your yeah. apartment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was one of the first displays that I built in the windows of the original City Reliquary display case, which was just a ground floor windows uh, at my then apartment. And uh, What kind of drove you to do that? Like, 
How come, you know? To me, some of these things seem obvious. <laughs> like when you when I walked into that first apartment and it was on the sidewalk level and there were windows with people walking by them, I thought, well, it seems like an obligation to put something <laughs> in those. People would get <laughs> curtains and be like, don't look in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The city reliquary in that situation became, for me, a bridge between not only myself and people walking by outside the windows, but the very diverse groups of people that were in the neighborhood that was constantly going through gentrification. So in a sense, if the old timers from the neighborhood could walk by and see something that they felt familiar with, then a newcomer could come by and see something that sparked their attention. And now those two very separated communities had some connection, a link, which was these odd displays in a window. I think in a sense, it was always my intent that, um, or at least hopeful goal, that people would be inspired to interact with it. And sure enough, those early windows because of the neighborhood, they had bars, iron bars in front of them for security. But what people started to do, thankfully, was use those iron bars to stuff little trinkets or mementos or things that they thought should belong in the windows. They just stick them behind the bars there. And those are some of my favorite objects um, where they're gifts of the city. And that's kind of what I always felt like this, the city reliquary was intended to be a gift, but in a, with some expectation for reciprocity. I always feel that it's our job to sort of go out into this city and find the things that inspire us. So how did you settle on the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, I think, you know, I've always been drawn towards iconography. The idea that, you know, you could give an image or a symbol of something that meant so much more than just the words and the meaning here and could have the same meaning apply to such a diverse group of people. We've often called the Statue of Liberty here at the Reliquary, I'll refer to her as like the secular saint of the New York Harbor uh, because it is... I like that. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at just icons and saints, you see them revered in a certain way that is intended to be inspiring. And the same thing is true for the Statue of Liberty, but she is intended to have all of that same power for people of the entire world. And I think that sort of idealism, although it's a little romantic, it's it was very accurate. And that's why New York City is, I think, the place that it is today is because people could come through and have this shared experience. It's nice to see like the varieties of all the different type of Statue of Liberties, mm -hmm. like ranging from really like gaudy to like really, <laughs> you know, accurate and like well-made. How many of these were donated and how many were part of your original? Oh, collection? gosh. At this point, I would say less than half are from my original collection, things that I like went out and actually purchased. I think as with any collection, I feel like you get to a certain point where you you reach a critical mass where people can easily identify it as a true collection. And when they see a bunch of Statue of Liberties on the shelf and they may have one or two at home that seem out of place, I think people inherently know like objects need to come together. And so because of that, you know, a lot of people, including Charlie DeLeo, has felt like, okay, this is a good home for this object, which set alone by itself may get lost in the mix. Can you tell me a little bit about your personal connection to the Statue of Liberty? How often uh, do you go there? Or ha <laughs> when was the last time you went there? I have to admit that recently that connection has not been as tangible. <laughs> <laughs> but at a time, uh, at the early point, I was then a tour guide and uh, for New York City with like a card carrying tour guide working on the double decker buses and stuff. And with that came some privileges, which meant I could get to the Statue of Liberty free of charge. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yes. And not only that, but I think I got like a discount or even a slightly, sometimes a free meal at the, at the snack shop there. So I, could, and this is a time when I was younger, I was in my twenties and freshly out of college and had a lot uh, more free time on your hands. <laughs> I had free time, but I didn't have a lot of money and I could use whatever discounted lunch I could find. And so sometimes I'd say, I'm going to hop on that ferry and go over to the Statue of Liberty and get a fish sandwich. <laughs> well, what was it like just going there so frequently? You know, most people see it 
maybe once or twice and yeah. it lives in their mind. Mm-hmm. They remember it with such gravitas. But what was it like for you to just be able to hop there and go for lunch? <laughs> I think it meant that it was fresh in my head and very tangible in the same way we described Charlie DeLeo, like sweeping those steps or polishing that glass. There's something about the physicality of it that helps you portray the significance of this icon to people, especially as a tour guide. You need to maintain that that true connection and that true inspiration and not just be telling the story from based on a script. And those moments, I think for me, they were contemplative. They were a moment to escape or recharge and do it in a meaningful way that I could come back and have a recent telling of what's going on at the statue. Even if it was the small things like slight change and the museum that existed within the pedestal, I'd like to keep up with that. And that was a source of inspiration for the city reliquary, like how they chose to display artifacts there definitely influenced me and the early displays that I started working on here. As an individual, personally, I don't, I'm not very spiritual, typically. I think Charlie DeLeo certainly was, and I think that came across in his actions and his poetry and stuff. But for me, just the realness of it was what was inspiring. You know, I think it was the tangible quality of this amazing construction and the engineering behind it that really inspired me. To be able to walk on those steps, the the armature of the statue is built by Monsieur Eiffel, who built the Eiffel Tower. And to know that we're climbing the steps designed by Eiffel is something that helped me feel like, all right, if that one person could do this, then I should expect a little bit more of myself, you know? <laughs> um, Very well put. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been really fortunate to have partnered with the Museum of Jewish Heritage when they did an exhibit about Emma Lazarus. They came to us to say, of course, because of her affinity for and association with the Statue of Liberty, we should have some physical version of that in the displays. And so they came in and took a look with some of their experts on Statue of Liberties and the historians on the figurines themselves who could identify, you know, which ones came from early casts and like are the some of the earliest versions of the Statue of Liberty, which date back to the early 1900s when she started to become mass produced in this form. So for us displaying these things, it comes from a place of sincerity and hopeful inspiration and just showing and emphasizing that true passion behind the collecting, but they were able to add another layer and educate people on the individual values. Whereas here we have maybe one of our most valuable Statue of Liberties right next to a matchbox with a Statue of Liberty on it from maybe 10 years ago. That way of assigning value to things differs from collector to collector. And I think that's why we had this same connection to Charlie DeLeo is because it came from a similar place of uh, sincere admiration. So tell me, how did the bulb actually come to you guys? Did Charlie say, hey, I heard that there's this museum or did you guys... (laughs) seek him out? Yeah, I sought him out and told him that we knew all about the story and it was one that we like to tell to our visitors at the city reliquary and to have something that could directly link us to him with something that was a genuine artifact. You know, all of the statuary figurines that we have here, they're genuine artifacts, but they aren't in a sense true relics the way we represent relics of the city. And this Statue of Liberty light bulb is actually something that was a part of the statue itself and is by necessity cast off. I'm sure they were just tossing those in the trash, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks to Charlie DeLeo, they at least got saved from the dumpster. But even then, in his care, of course, he is the ultimate caretaker of the Statue of Liberty. But they aren't on public view where he had this um, the light bulb originally. And I think in part, that is what I would imagine was his inspiration for sharing it with us, is now more people just besides him and me and a few people that he chose to show it to, now people every single single week can come here and see this and be inspired in their own way. And that really sort of defines how we started building the city reliquaries, looking for things that were cast offs or might be overlooked by most people or even thrown in the garbage or in the gutter and using them as a point of departure to tell a much bigger story. Because that gives you a sense that these objects that seem easily attainable or that are part of people's everyday lives today, give them some connection to that history.
This has been Undiscarded Stories of New York, a podcast brought to you by the City Reliquary Museum and Civic Organization in Brooklyn, New York, in partnership with Citizen Race Car. My name is Tanya Muhammad, and I produce this show in collaboration with David Hoffman, who edits the stories. Post-production and original music by Jose Miguel Baez. Contributing producer, Jacob Ford. Production manager, Gabriela Montequin. Outreach manager, Sarah Shalantano. And a special thanks to Dave Herman. To learn more about these artifacts, check out undiscarded.org and be sure to follow at City Reliquary on Instagram for facts and pictures. Head to cityreliquary.org to hear all about the museum's mission, exhibits, and events. If you enjoyed this episode of Undiscarded, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review, and help spread the word. There are so many more stories to tell. 